Grace, mercy, and peace from God Almighty and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I spoke to you last week on the Advent theme of hope. Using for my point of departure, Isaiah's famous image of swords being beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks so that war would be learned no more. Much of what I said to you was about the futility of force as a means of making peace and the hope that we would see through the myths of war and rise above the use of force for settling our conflicts. On this second Sunday in Advent, the theme of the day is peace as represented in the image of God's holy mountain, where there is at last no hurt and no destruction, a perfect peace that is more, far more than the absence of conflict. It's often observed that there can be no peace where there is no justice. Injustice is invariably a source of conflict, and there will be conflict as long as there is injustice. Aggrieved people will fight to settle their grievances, and we can hardly blame them. An unprovoked attack is an injustice against which the attacked are generally thought to be justified in their self-defense. So as the slogan goes, if you want peace, work for justice. Surely this is a worthy sentiment, though it falls short of the vision of peace that we find in Isaiah. In our lesson for today, the prophet foretells the appearance of one who is in the lineage of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, who became Israel's most illustrious king. The one foretold will bring peace. Now we, of course, we, of course, identify this bringer of peace with Jesus of Nazareth. And we are not wrong to do so, though we can be certain. We can be certain that Isaiah did not have Jesus in mind when he expressed his hope for one upon whom the Spirit of God would rest. But be that as it may, of the one foretold, Isaiah says, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. Now this is not, you will note, Judgments by the standards of common justice. Justice requires impartial evidence, uh, impartial evaluation of evidence. Isn't this what we hope will occur in our courts when they're operating at their best? Witnesses are called, documents are presented in an effort to get to the facts of the case, and then arrive at a just settlement. In this way, evidence is offered, decision is rendered, and penalty is assigned to bring justice to a situation where justice has been in question. But as satisfying as this may be when it works well, this is not what Isaiah expects from the descendant of Jesse, who Isaiah says will not judge will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. Indeed, the judge foretold by Isaiah is biased. He has a bias for the poor. The decision maker has a bias. He's biased for the meek. As we all know, Big money dominates the political process in our land. 
Big money is given to candidates to foster the interests of big money. In the recent election, the insurance industry, for example, contributed through circuitous channels some $86 million to candidates that would oppose health care reform once they were in office. On another front, neither the present Congress nor the new Congress is going to do anything to regulate the financial sector that brought the world to the brink of economic collapse and had to be bailed out by us. This, don't forget, this financial sector is a part of our economy that doesn't design, doesn't build, doesn't sell a single tangible product. As it said, we have the best Congress money can buy, which one would think should make us as angry as Jesus when he threw the money changers out of the temple. In this gilded age in which we're living, pointing out the excesses of the rich and the way in which the rich deform life for the rest of us in this society and in the world, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. (laughs) And in bringing this up in this particular congregation, I know that I'm preaching to the choir. You're aware of the problem. You know the problem. What we do about the problem is another thing entirely. But even as I rant on about the injustices that are done to the poor and the middle class, fairness demands that we admit that the poor are not necessarily more virtuous than the rich. It's not because the poor are essentially good as the rich are not that they are promised special treatment from the judge whose coming Isaiah foretells. No, the poor are not more virtuous than the rich. They are merely less dangerous. But because life is hard for the poor, as it is not for the rich, the righteous judge takes poverty into account. They are judged with righteousness, which is to say they are made equal by the judgment of the righteous judge. In short, there's a different standard of judgment for the poor and the meek than for the rich and the haughty until at last all are equal. There's a far better chance that there will be peace in the world if justice is done. But justice can be done and the poor still remain poor. Nor will equal opportunity be enough to produce equity. For there to be equal opportunity, you know, we would all have to start from the same place. But we don't and we can't. To judge with righteousness and to decide with equity is to change the meaning of justice as we commonly understand it. The peace that is represented in the description of God's holy mountain is a peace rooted in righteousness and equity. And it must be said, it is a peace that defies our understanding. But even though this peace is beyond our reckoning, it is nevertheless the peace by which we are to judge such peace as we do enjoy and are able to make. This is the model, this is the standard for what peace means. We must hope for nothing less than the peace which is God's holy mountain. John the Baptist out there by the river, railing at the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you that God is able 
from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. That is to say, presume no privileges for yourself. All are equal in God's sight. No one can claim to love and serve God who is not striving to realize the equity of all God's children. This is where the Sadducees and the Pharisees have gone wrong, according to John Baptist. In this wonderful Advent season, and it really is a wonderful season, we are, it is really a blessing to us to have this season. We're given four watchwords by the church in order to guide our longing and to inspire us to want with all of our hearts the things of God. Hope last week, peace today, joy and love in the weeks to come. Things that we Christians identify in Christ. It goes without saying that God's holy mountain is nowhere in the world. It is a utopia. What does utopia mean? It means nowhere, nowhere, not to be found. But it is nonetheless that holy mountain, the measure of the peace we know as well as being a peace to inspire our longing for a world made new. The theme of peace represented in Isaiah's vision of God's holy mountain reminds me of of another equally transcendent and utopian vision of peace. It comes from Ursula Le Guin, remarkable science fiction author from her novel, The Dispossessed. And I think it's apparent in a character's brief description of life on the anarchist utopian planet named Anaris. It goes like this. We are sharers, not owners. We are not prosperous. None of us is rich. None of us is powerful. If it is Anaris you want, if it is the future that you seek, then I tell you, you must come to it with open hands. You must come to it alone and naked as a child comes into the world, into his future, without any past, without any property, wholly dependent on other people for his life. You cannot take what you have not given. And you must give yourself. You cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit or it is nowhere. This is the spirit of those who long in Christ's name for God's peace, a spirit longing for a world made new, a world where at last, at last, none shall be afraid. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.